Hi, Jason and Emma. How are you? I'm okay, thank you. We are going to do final review today. Hi everyone, how are you doing? <clears throat> so check out final review in Canvas module. I'm doing good, Sarah. Thank you. Happy Monday. <laughs> we'll start in a few minutes, so. If you have any questions before then, let me know. We also have um, a quiz coming up this week, so I'll talk about that. We'll do the final review together. So I'm waiting to open my files. Hello everyone, those that just joined, please look over your final review. We'll start in a couple minutes. <clears throat> So we have a few weeks left before final exam. Make sure that you are submitting all the work that's missing and also work on your project, don't forget. And then I'll talk about final exam shortly. <clears throat> Okay, we'll start in a minute, okay?
Okay, so at six o'clock, let's get started. Um, if I'm able to cover all the questions today, which I likely will, um, you can finish final review part one and two with me today. I will share the video on Zoom in case you want to go back and watch it <clears throat> or if you miss something. Um, and just a reminder, there is a quiz three and an extra credit for the quiz review game. So if you wanted to participate in the game, make sure that you turn in your extra credit. This is due on the 23rd. And also there is um, a quiz three. Let me double check the date and make sure. Yep. Okay. Um, that is going to be for the last few chapters that we had covered. Uh, 5, 12, 13, and 16. Um, in the final exam, that's going to come up in June, okay, after the course project. So you will find the final review in the, its own module here, right beneath quiz three. So these are the two things that we're doing this week. Don't forget about your course project. I had posted the install lockdown browser information. So going into the final week, make sure that you are, um, you have install lockdown browser. And just to make a note that it does not work with Chromebook. So if you're using Chromebook, um, make sure that you look at laptop loans or maybe borrow a computer for the exam. Um, and when you're using lockdown browser, it's not going to let you open other applications. So it's going to ask you to close out all the other applications. It's a browser to be able to use Canvas um, quiz with. So if you and inside the actual application, I enable the um, scientific calculator so you're able to use that but you will not be able to have the programmer mode on that calculator um, so as you complete the final it's going to be multiple choice 50 questions um, it will be password protected and i will release the password um, in the announcement and also in the final module so you just have to log on to canvas that week and it's going to be open, let me go back one page, um, the beginning of the week. And you are going to have until the night to finish and you can take it any, at any time. So for the two days, you can just set up the time that you wanted to take it and you can complete it. And so that way your grade will be updated. And going into the final week, I will make sure that I have all your grades updated except for the final project and the final exam and any extra credit that's going to be included at the end. So there is another extra credit that's going to be on the course survey and I will open that um, next week. Okay, so now if we finish the final review today, again, you will not have the lab this week, but I will be available on Zoom. Um, on Wednesday and next week on Monday and Wednesday um, for questions or any concern. If we don't finish both parts today, I would like to hold the second part next week. And, and I hope that I will be able to achieve um, all the questions today. Okay, but you don't have to submit this until May 31st. I like for you to use it as a guide to study. A lot of the questions had we had gone over in our assignments and notes. So you should be able to answer most of these questions on your own. Okay, any question before we start? Okay, and so as I mentioned, we are gonna cover the final review you will find a part one in the part one assignment under the final review module in Canvas. So the first part, we're gonna start with chapter one. And in the first few chapters, we in chapter one, we did binary hexadecimal 
decimal conversion. And very similar to the quiz, you will find questions that would include um, size of your data that would be, part, be meant to include for the answer. So in the questions, it would ask you to convert a certain value, and then it would ask you for the answer in either word size, byte size, double word size, or quad words. And just a reminder, a byte is going to be eight bits. So your answer should have eight bits. If it tells you that it's a word size, then that means that it's going to be 16 bits or a double words that's going to be 32 bits or a quad word that will be 64 bits. Okay, so in this question, question one, it asks you to convert decimal value 147 to binary. And we want to express this in byte. So um, we can use the subtraction method, or if you prefer to use the division method, that will be fine. So as I illustrated here, we're using the table or the scale for the conversion. And so you would start with 147 and you look at the scale. What's the largest number you can subtract from? So that's going to be 128. If you subtract that number, you're going to put a one on the top. And then what's left is 19. And so in 19, we're not going to subtract 64 or 32. So we're going to put zero there. The next number we're going to subtract is 16. So we're going to put a one on the top. So 19 subtract 16 gives us three. And so we have three left. Three cannot subtract eight. So we put a zero on the top. Three cannot subtract four because it's smaller than. So we would put a zero on the top and three, we will be able to subtract two on the scale. So that will be, we put a one on the top and that gives us one left. One subtract one, we would have zero. So our binary would be these. So when we write that out, that will be one zero zero one zero zero one one. So I know thus far we've been using the programmer calculator, but make sure that you know how to do this manually as you will not have the programmer mode in your lockdown browser, okay? So you're gonna see something like this on your final exam, very similar to what you've seen in the quiz in the past, where we convert from decimal to binary. Any question with one? Okay, so when we go in reverse, we want for number two, we want to convert binary value 10101110 to a decimal number. And we previously did the subtraction, we used the subtraction method in number one. So we are going to go in reverse and we're going to use the addition method in number two. And in number two, what I have done is I use the same scale and it's always gonna be the same. You start with one and it's multiple of two, right? As you proceed from the right to the left and the right is the least significant bit and the left side is the most significant bit. And then you would put the binary values onto the scale, one for each, okay? And then we're only gonna add up the number for the decimal equivalents that have the ones. That those are the bits that are on. So we start with the right-hand side, we're gonna add the two, then we're gonna add the four, then we're gonna add the eight, then we're gonna add the 32, then we're gonna add the 128. So all of that added, that's gonna give us 174 and we're going to use the subscript 10 to indicate that it is a decimal value, okay? And in the binary, technically you can use a subscript 2 to indicate that it's binary, but most of the time when we see the binary, it's a 0 and 1, so we automatically would know. 
So in this one, when we convert from binary to decimal, we would use the addition method and we would use the same scale where it would be multiple of two, starting with one on the most right-hand side. And we would add up the value for the decimal equivalent that has the one on the top. And that once we sum everything up, we would have the decimal um, output for S answer. Okay, any question with number two? Yes, Sarah. So, um, I see that you have the table. Did you want us to create the table? No, you don't have to create the table, whichever way that would be easy for you, right? I just used the table to illustrate it as it would be very visual for the students. So, yeah, if you, if you, if it's easy for you to make a table, you can. Okay. All right, any other questions? So if you simply just, if you already know the scale, you can simply add it up and provide the answer that will be fine. Okay, it doesn't have to be in the exact format. All right, next we're gonna move into hexadecimal conversion. And for number three, we are gonna convert a hexadecimal value, which should be indicated with the subscript 16, right, um, to a decimal number, which is a base 10. And keep in mind that hexadecimal, when you go from zero through nine in hex, that's gonna be equivalent to zero through nine in decimal, okay? And so, when we're looking at the digits in the hexadecimal, we would know that C is equivalent to 12 in decimal and F is equivalent to 15 in decimal. And so when you write this out, you would start with the least significant value, which is the two on the right. And here I'm using a multiplication method so I would take the two, which is the most right digit, and I would multiply it by 16 to the zero because it's the first digit in that value. Then I'm gonna add that to the next digit, multiply it by 16 to the first. And so when we see the F, that will be 15, and we would multiply it by 16 to the first. And as we move from one digit to the next from right to left, we would increase the exponent, right, for 16. So here we go from zero to one. And so here we would have 15 times 16 to the first to represent the conversion for F to decimal. Then we're gonna add that to the next value, which is three, and we're gonna take three, we're gonna multiply it by 16 to the second. Again, I move from the F to three, so we're gonna increase the exponent by one. So here I would do 16 to the second times three. Then we're gonna plus that with C, which is 12, in decimal and we would take 12, multiply it by 16 to the third as we go from three to C. So we have to increase one in the exponent for the, the one on the left. So once we multiply everything out and add them together, we should have uh, 50,162 in decimal for the answer for number three. So the way that we approach number three is we use the multiplication method. And another way that you can do this is you can convert everything to binary and then from binary to decimal. And every hex would represent four bits. But in this case, what we would do is we would use the multiplication method 
and we would start with the right digit and we would multiply it by 16 to the power of n, starting with the right digit that will be zero for n. And we would add that to the subsequent conversion value and we would increase the exponent for the 16 by one as we move from right to left for each of the digit. And so this is the multiplication method. And when you are converting hexadecimal to a decimal, you would use the multiplication method. And we would multiply it by 16 to the power of n. Okay, so make sure that we know how to convert hexadecimal to decimal for the final. Okay. And for number four, um, we would operate the subtraction. And remember that when you have a zero subtract one, you have to borrow from the left column, right? And then you've got to operate that borrow just like very similar technique to what you've seen with the addition. And that would use the adder right? And with the adder, it's going to subsequently um, implement the proper operator so that way you would have the output. So here, if I take 10001110, subtract 00000111. Now, when you put this into the calculator, the calculator is not going to register the zero before that's okay, right? But when we do it manually, I place them there so that way you can line them up as you hand write or if you um, type it out, it will be easy. Um, you don't have to show all the details in the work for the final. I just wanted to make sure that you know how to do this. So this is why I'm going over the questions, okay? So you would start with the right digit, subtract the other right digit. So zero, subtract one right, you get a one and then you're gonna borrow. So you're gonna take the, you're gonna handle two number at a time. So the top with the borrow and then the result from that and take that result and then subtract the, the one from the bottom. So your output should be this, okay? So make sure we know how to do binary arithmetic. Um, for the final exam, okay? Especially subtraction and addition. So for number five, we are doing addition with binary. And in the addition with binary, again, you can line them up, right? Line all the digits up. And then when you, you would do the add and remember the rules, right? In, in the first chapter notes, you know, when you subtract zero, what happens? When you have zero, subtract zero, what happens? So here, when we line them up, we're gonna start with the right digit. We're gonna add them. So um, one plus zero, we're gonna get a one, right? Zero plus zero, we're gonna get a zero and so on. But when you get a one, plus a one, right? What's gonna happen there? So make sure that you remember how to carry, right? When you have certain digits added to bring it over to the left column. And you would operate again, right? That the, the carry with the top number, get a result and then take that result and then add it with the lower number and you would get the final result for that column and then move over to the next digit to the left. So with that, when we did the addition, we would have 10011101 for number five. Okay, any question? Okay. Then for number six, we are going to convert decimal value 402 to a hexadecimal value. And earlier we went from hexadecimal to decimal, we did multiplication for number three. 
In number six, when we go in reverse, we go from decimal to hexadecimal, we would then use division method. And so for six, we would start with 402 and we would go ahead and divide that by 16. I would receive, I would get 25 as a quotient and the remainder from that will be two. And I wanna make note of the remainder because the remainder is gonna be my hexadecimal value, right? So this is gonna give you the least significant bit or the least significant digit. Um, then we have the quotient still. So we would take 25 and we would divide that by 16 again. And we would get one as a quotient and nine as a remainder. So we wanna make note of the quotient and the remainder. So here I would put nine as a remainder. Since I still have one, I have to divide it again. So I would take one divided by 16. I would get zero as a quotient and one as a remainder. So as you go through the division, right, you would end up with, right, something that the last step would be the value that's less than 16 and you would get zero as a quotient and then the remainder, that would be your last step. Then to write out the answer, we're gonna go from bottom to top or left to right. So the top line is gonna be your least significant value, which is the most right-handed value. So we would have two because that's from the remainder here. And then the next one is gonna be nine, okay? And then the next one is gonna be one. So our decimal is gonna, or our hexadecimal is gonna be 100 and 192 base 16, which is the converted value from 402 decimal. Okay, so make sure we know how to convert decimal to hexadecimal, and in number six, we use the division method. Any question with these? Okay, so for number seven, we would need to find the twos complement. Let me drop this to the next page, okay. The twos complement for A, B, and C. So we'll start with A and you're given a decimal value 567. And so the first thing that you need to do when you're given a decimal and you need to find the twos complement is you need to convert it to binary, okay? So we would take five, six, seven and convert it to binary. You can use the division method or the subtraction method, that's up to you. Okay. Once you have the binary, which I have here, is one zero zero one one zero one one one. Then I would begin with the ones complement. Okay, the ones complement require us to, AKA, flip the bits, right? So we would not it. Okay, not whatever is here. So we would take the one and change it to the zero for the ones complement, and the zero change it to a one for the ones complement. So if I have a binary equivalence for 567 here, it's ones complement will be the opposite of it, which is the not, right? We would operate the not here. So that will be 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, okay? We're not done here. We have to go one more step to make it two's complement. So then we would take the one's complement and we would add one to it. 
So when you add the one, if you don't have any carry, that would just drop to the back here. Now, the reason why that I show the ones here, right? If the answer is expressed in a word for 16 bits, it's going to add all the ones in the front. Okay. But if the answer is expressed in a certain size, you notice that it's going to drop off the ones. And that can indicate different things if you don't be careful with that. Right. So for the quiz and even the exam that it, as you've seen in the quiz for the exam, I would um, include how the answer would be expressed. Okay, so if we have a larger space to contain all those bits, right, we would then have all the ones in the front. Okay, and in this one, we wanted to keep it as binary. Okay, but if you're asked to convert that back to decimal, which I usually don't ask you to convert after the, the changes. But if, it's, if you're asked to convert it back, then you have to be able to convert it back from binary to decimal. Then for question B, you're given a binary. And so that way we are ahead of step already. We don't have to convert anything there. We simply start with the ones complement based on the given binary. So we would flip the bits, right? We would apply the not operator to the given binary. So when we flip the bits, the zero becomes the one and the ones become the zero. And so you write those out. Then again, you would then proceed to the twos complement after you have the ones complement, you would then add the one to it. And so you would have the one added because when you add the one, it's simply added with the zero. So it changes this with the plus one, right? But if it's, again, if it's expressed in the word size, then you have to extend the sign bits in the front, okay? To fit the word. Okay, any question? All right. Um, for C, you would have B93. And so what you need to do is you need to convert this into binary. And earlier I mentioned that you can use hexadecimal and make it for each of the digit in the hex is going to represent four bits. So I highlighted these for you to show you the conversion. So three is going to be represented as zero, zero, one, one. And then nine is going to be another four bits next to it, one, zero, zero, one. And then B is going to be one, zero, one, one. So all together, this is the binary for B93 in hexadecimal. So after we convert it to binary, so whichever number um, system that you're working with, except for binary, right? If you're working with decimal or hexadecimal, you wanted to convert it to binary first when you begin the, twos, the process for the twos complement. After you get it to the binary level or the binary equivalents, then you would start with the ones complement when you would take that and knot it or flip the bits, okay? Then after we flip the bits, then we would be able to add one to it for the twos complement. So don't forget to do a plus one. Many students forget to do the plus one. Um, so because if you don't add the one, you're only at the one's complement. So you need to have a plus one. So once we add the one, I'll just drop that one with the value there. Okay. 
but as we express it in the word size, we need to have the sign extended bits in the front. Okay, to show that it's negative. Okay. And I don't think I have D for you guys. Okay. But in this one, as you can see, I also have another hex. Change it to binary, flip the bits, add the one, and I have the final result. Okay, so make sure we know how to do two's complement for decimal, hexadecimal, and binary. You will see those on the test. For question eight, um, it asks you to use and, or, and not operator. And we got to remember the and, the or, and the not rules. Okay. When you end something with a zero, it's always going to give you a zero. Okay. When you or something with a one, it's always going to give you a one. When you not something, it's going to be the opposite. So in question 8a, it asks you to and, right, this binary with this binary. So you would start with the, the least significant bit which is the most right-hand bit, you would say, okay, zero and one, that's gonna give me a zero, zero and one, that's gonna give me a zero and so on, okay? And then, so as you move to the left, right, you would be able to operate, use the operator to give you the result. So make sure that we know how to use the operator and not an or with binary. In 8B, we are using or operator. And so we would have zero or one. And as I mentioned earlier, anytime you or it with the one, you get a one. So zero or one, start with the least significant bit, you get a one one or zero, you get a one, right? Zero or zero, you get a zero. And this is different than adding or subtracting, okay? So make sure that we understand how to use these operators. So when I or these two together, I would have the output will be as that. Okay. And then when we use the not operator, just like what we did with the ones complement, we would take the binary that's given to us and we would flip the bits. Okay. So we would then have one becomes zero, one becomes zero, zero becomes one, and so on. Sorry about my dog. Let me double check. One, zero, one, one. Okay. Then what we need is we need to, I think it ends there. Yep. We need to extend it for the sign in the front to be able to fit it into a word length. Okay. I think I'm missing something. Hold on one second. Uh, not that's going to be one and then a zero. Let me double check. Zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one, one, zero, zero. One, one, zero, zero, and then a one. <clears throat> okay. 
So once we flip it, we still have to sign extend it. So in order to fit the, the bits for 16 bits, then we would have to include the sign bits in the front. Any questions with the operators? Okay, so for nine, when Boolean expression is used, uh, when is Boolean expression used in disjunctive normal form, your DNF, right? Um, like A and B or C and D, okay? So when we're looking at the term inside that term, it would be and together and then one term to the next, it's gonna or, okay? So inside each term here, you would have the and, and then from one term to the next, you would have the or. So the conditions based on our notes and our assignments, the variables within the term are and together. The terms are or together, as we see here in the example. Every variable and its complement are represented in every term. So if you have the complement, it would have the complement symbol in the front. No parentheses or other Boolean operators appear in the expression. So it would be specifically with these operators and you won't have additional parentheses within, okay? So make sure that we know how to express, how to use Boolean expression for disjunctive normal form and uh, conjunctive normal form, okay? And we did that at the beginning when we we're looking at the terms and how they would be expressed and to distinguish between the two. Okay. So for the conjunctive, you would have the or inside and the and outside. Okay, the or in the term and the and out, outside the, to combine the terms. Then in question 10, it goes over sets. So we're given sets S2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, and 18. And it asks you for cardinality of that set, which is the number of elements in that set. And you count them up to four, six, eight, and nine. So here I have nine elements. So the way that we denote cardinality is that we would use the pipe and then the, the set name and then another pipe. And that gives us nine. Okay, for 11, it asks you to denote the empty set and you can use the zero with the strike through symbol or curly braces together with nothing inside that denote an empty set. Any questions on sets? Okay, yeah, no problem, Devin. Okay. And all of these we've gone through in the chapters, okay? So you can go back to your notes and your assignments. That's what they're designed to do. So you can look them over. Number 12, determine X, if X is equal to Y when X is 555, 555, 5,555, 55,555. And Y is 555, 555, 5,555, and 55,555. Explain your answer. So like we said, the first thing um, that we, earlier we talked about cardinality. So the first thing that you need to determine is are the sets equal in cardinality? Do they have the same number of elements? 
right? Check, right? I counted up one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. So they both have five elements. Then you see if they're exactly matching in values for each of the elements. And if they are exact, then they are equal. So we can say that x is equal to y because they contain the same elements. Then in question 13, um, for to determine if A is equal to B and C. So we look at set A, which is negative 2, 55, 23, 91, 67, 82, and 10. Set B, 67, negative 2, 82, 55, 10, and 91. And then C, 23, 91, 10, negative 2, 67, 4, and 55. And it's tricky because it's not organized, right, a certain way. So the first thing, like, like we mentioned before, we need to look at the cardinality. So you count up the number of elements in each set. If they're the same, then you need to determine if they're matching in values. So we then when we look at the values, right, we would see what is it lacking? Well, B has 91 and A doesn't. Oh, actually they both do. Uh, you look at 23, A has 23 and B doesn't, but C does, right? And then C has four, B doesn't have four and A doesn't have four. So already we would see that they don't have the same exact elements. So that means that they're not equal. So A is not equal to B or C as they contain different values or elements. And we can also say that B is not equal to C for the same reason. Okay, number 14, here we are going to look at the set of natural numbers for y squared is less than 20. And we wanted to use set notation to indicate the expression. So we have a set of 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Right, 11, 12, 13, 14, 16. So now in the given set, right, if you take y is 5 and you square it, it will be larger than 20. Okay. Question? Uh. Okay, so here the way that we denote this is going to be Eric, I think you're not on mute. So just want you to know. All right, so we would have y is an element of n, which is the natural number. It's okay, no problem. And we would say that y squared is less than 20. But given this set, um, right, you it would not be able to accommodate the set values. Okay, but in, in this, we just wanted to set up the set notation. But given this set, knowing that it will not be able to accommodate y squared is less than 20. Okay, so that's how we would use that notation. For 15, you're given t is equal to 2, 4, u is 6, 8, w is 1, 3. And you need to determine the Cartesian products for t 
times u times w. And so you would start with the first number, right, which is two, and then you would go to the first number for u. So I have a two and a six. And then again, I would start with two and I go to the first number for the W, which is a one. And then I start with the first number of T and then I move to the second number of U and I have two A. And then I have a first number for T and the second number for W, I would have three. So you would have variations of these for the output from the Cartesian products. And I didn't type everything out here, but you get the idea, right? Then we would move to the second number and so on. Okay. So Jason asked, if wouldn't a Cartesian products of a set of three given a tuple, but you don't have three in the number because I don't have a third value here. So your container is gonna be a set of two or a subset of two within a larger set because it's actually if you count everything up, right, it's gonna be two to the power of eight. You have a pair in the set and in that you would have the variations in the pair. So, uh -huh. but if I have a third number like this, right? then I would have a subset that would contain three. Okay, so when when you count it up, you would have, we, we talked about how we would use power, right, um, to represent the Cartesian product. So you would have a total of two to the eight. Okay, which is 32. All right, so for 16, um, explain the relationship of set A and set B given the Venn diagram, right? So you are looking at the universe is the rectangle. B is a subset of A and A is a set in the universe. So you can say B is a subset of A or B is included in A, right? That means that every element of A is also an element of B. So B can have one, two, three, four. And that means that A also have one, two, three, four, right? So that would represent the larger set and the subset. So the way that we denote the subset is that we would use the C with the line underneath. So here that will be B is a subset of A. If B is a subset of A, that in that case, B might be equal to A, right? If they have the same cardinality, it might be, okay? And if B is a set of uh, B is a set of A if B is a subset of A, but it is not equal to B. And it could be because A might have larger or higher cardinality. So that means every element of A, it could be an element of B, but there at least an, one element of B that is not an element of A. That's would then we would say that B is a proper set of A or a proper subset, I should say. And in Python, you would see this being very um, visible, right, in the programming side. 
also in C++, you can incorporate set STL. Okay, we, we touch a little bit on that. Um, so for 17, you're given R, S, and T with the values and you want to determine the union and the intersection for these. Okay, so for A, okay, we need to look at the intersection of R and S. That means that we're gonna look at the values that they would have the same or in common between these sets. So we notice that R has 10 and 15 and S had 10 and 15. And then for B, so we would note that for the answer for A. For B, we would have S intersects with T. So we look at the S set and the T, we wanted to see what they have as the same. We would have 15, right? and 25 and 35. So 15, 25 and 35 are, would be the value that would be the intersection of S and T. Then on uh, C, the intersection of R and T, again, we look at those sets and we would see that 15 and 60 right r have 15 and 60 same with t that will be the intersection so make sure that we know intersection and union okay for sets then for 18 Given D one three five six seven nine and eleven E two four six seven ten and F is three four seven twelve, we need to determine the symmetric difference for right D and E. Okay, so symmetric difference is a little bit. It's not the same as when we're looking at just difference, right? Symmetric difference is what we're gonna combine the differences from both sets. So when we look at D, D has one and, and E does not. So we put down the one, okay? And then we look at D has three and E does not, right? And then same thing over here, E has two and D does not and so on five, right? But they both have six and seven, so we don't include those for our answer. We looked at nine, the other one doesn't have it. So nine, 10 on E and not on D. So we put 10 and 11 on D and not on E. So here we would have the symmetric difference between D and E. And we would repeat the same process for E and F, right? We would include the values that the other set doesn't have. And we would have two, three, six, 10, and 12. Okay, so for 19, this is when we deal with power sets. And so in 19, it asks you to determine the power sets given S is two, three, four. We would start with the first subset that will be zero or empty, nothing. I shouldn't say zero, it's just zero elements that will be empty set. <clears throat> and then we would then break that main set into one element subset, which is two, three, and four. Okay, you see that here. And then we would then have the main set broken down into two element set, subset, which would be two, three, two, four, and three, four. 
And then we would have the subset with three elements that will be two, three, and four. So when you count this up, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, you should have eight sets because there are three numbers. And so when you raise two to the third, right, that's gonna show you the number of subsets that you would have, which is eight subsets. Okay, so our power sets are illustrated there. Any questions on this one? All right, let's move on. For number 20, um, this is when we start going into combinatorics, right? And permutation. So on 20, uh, it asks you to determine when some rule is applicable. And some rule is applicable when one must make one choice from the union of two or more sets of alternatives. So you have to pick a choice, like when you're picking a soup or a sandwich, right? Okay. For 21, when is product rule applicable in common Tory? Product rule is applicable when you make two or more consecutive choices in the sets of alternatives. So if we need to choose soup and sandwich, right, for our meal, then that means that we're making two consecutive choices. So that would be then we would apply the product rule to determine combinations for soup and sandwiches. Okay. For 22, to open a combination padlock, you must use three numbers, 0 to 40. How many combination of numbers can you use? So we're given the set 0 through 40. Its cardinality is 41. And we can use three numbers. So that will be 41 raised to the third. So that means that it's gonna be 68,921 variations or combinations using three numbers from zero to 40. Okay. Any questions on combinations? For the next question, uh, 23, there are three groups of audiences, 30 people in group one, 40 people in group two, and 50 people in group three. How many distinct ways can a person be selected from all three groups to win a prize. We are making one choice in the sets of alternatives. So we are using some rule, one choice. We're picking one person. So you take the first group, which is 30 people, add it with the second group, which is 40, and add it to the third group, which is 50, which gives you 120 distinct ways to pick one person from all three groups. Make sure we know how to do these. You will see similar ones on the test. Question B for 23, how many distinct ways you can select, uh, you, how many distinct ways can a person be selected from each group to meet a performer? And in this case, we're selecting one person from each group. That means that we're gonna pick, we're gonna have three choices. So we would then use the product rule. So we will take 30 times 40 times 50, which gives us 60,000 ways to pick a person from each group. Okay. 
Okay. For 23C, how many distinct ways can five people be selected from a group uh, from group three to win tickets for the next event? So we would take, right, because it's five, we would look at group three and group three has 50 people. So we would start with 50. We take one person out, we would multiply that by 49 remove that person, another person, we would have multiply by 48, remove another one, 47, remove the fifth one, that will be 46, and we stop. Then we have five selection. So in this, because we are making five consecutive, we are making five choices from that group, we would then need to multiply using the product rule. So 50 times 49 times 48 times 47 times 46 gives us 254,251,200 ways to select five people from group three. Okay, so you so when you look at the probability in that, pretty low, right? So all these contests and, and prices, now you can see how that would be for chance. For 23D, how many distinct ways can five people be selected from all of the groups to win backstage passes? <clears throat> so when we look at all the groups, that's 120 from question A. So we would start there. And again, we're selecting five, so we are multiplying. So we would do 120 times 119, remove one person times 118, remove another one times 117, remove the, the last one times 116, <clears throat> which gives us the output, okay? So that's from all three groups. Any questions with combinatorics? Okay, so make sure we know the definition for permutation. You will see it on the test. It asks you what is permutation and it is an ordered arrangement of set or subset of objects. And that what makes permutation different than combination in that order matters, right? Okay. Okay, 24, uh, 25. There are 35 students in the class. If the course project requires four students per group, how many variations of groups can be performed for the project? So we have 32 students and we're gonna choose four. So we are using the choose formula on this one, right? So you would start with 32 factorial of 32, which is going to be your set, okay, divided by the value that we choose and apply the factorial for that. So 4 factorial multiply it by n minus r, right? So your n is 32 because that's the number of students. So 32 minus 4. And then we want to make sure that we apply the factorial for that as well. So remember to use the parentheses accordingly. Otherwise, you're going to get the wrong output. 
And so we should have 35,960 variations in choosing four student groups in a 32 student class. And again, we would use the same equation for number 26. It asks you if a toddler is choosing three toys from the toy box, which contains 12 toys, how many variations of toys can the toddler choose? So we have 12 toys in the box. That's going to be the value for n. And your R is your choose. Your choices are three. So you're choosing three here. So you would take n factorial, which is 12 factorial, divided by r factorial, which is 3 factorial, multiply it by n minus r, 12 minus 3 factorial, which gives you 120 ways to choose 3 toys from the box of 12 toys. Okay. For 27, if a first grade teacher wants to select four boys and four girls to do the talent show in the class of 20 students of 10 boys and 10 girls, how many ways can the teacher select these students? So as we are selecting the same number of girls and boys, we only have to apply the formula one time and then we multiply it. So we would choose four out of the 10. So we would have n is equal to 10 and r is equal to four. So we would have 10 factorial divided by four factorial times 10 minus four factorial. That's gonna give you the variations of boy or girl selection. Then once you have that output, you would multiply, right, by itself to be able to give you the variations of both boys and girls. Okay, I didn't type out the answer there. You can put this into your calculator, find the output, the result, and then take that multiply it by itself. You would have the variations of both boys and girls. Okay, you will see something like that on the exam. Any questions with using the equation to determine the variation in the choices from the set? Okay, for question eight, it's a, uh, 28, it's a little lengthy. This is when we cover binomial theorem. And you have a plus b to the fifth power. And so you would start with zero choice out of the five. Your first variable, which is a, that will be to the fifth power. And then your second variable would be zero as you choose zero for b. You're going to add that. In the next one, we would choose one for B. And so we would then subtract. No, Jason, we don't have to. Jason asks if we need to compute each binomial coefficient. No. Yeah, I just, you can just write it out like this. And then, you know, you can use the, the triangle to put all of that together. But I just wanted to show how we will be able to write it out with the what we covered previously. Um, 
And then for the next one, we would choose two for B. So as you increase in the value, the exponent for B, you would then reduce, right, by one for the first variable exponent, which is A. And so either way, they all have to be a total of five. So here we would have three, A to the third and B to the second, and we choose two for B. Then we would choose three for B on the next one. So A is to the second and B is to the third. And then when we choose four, that will be A is to the first and B is to the fourth. And then lastly, we choose five for B. That will be A to the zero and then B to the fifth. Okay, and having it like this is good enough for me. Okay, and so same thing for B, okay, so you have to the eighth power, so you start with zero for Q, and K to the eight, and so on. Okay. So go over binomial if you are not familiar with it or you forgot about it. Make sure that um, you know how to be able to apply binomial theorem. 29, assume that a pair of dice is used in a game, determine the answer for the following questions. Question A, um, determine the sample space for the dice. So you have a pair, so each dice have six faces. So we would then take six multiplied by six because we have two dice. So that gives us 36 for your sample space. Then when you're looking at the probability for B, the probability of rolling a sum of seven with a pair of dice. So we look at variations and how we can roll a seven. We will start with one dice is gonna be one and the other is gonna be six. That will be giving us a sum of seven. Second combination is two and five. Third combination is three and four. Fourth combination is four and three. Fifth combination is two and or five and two. Okay. And then lastly, our sixth combination is six and one. So when we count this up, we have six combinations, and that's going to give us six divided by 36. Or we can reduce that down to one six. Okay and decimal equivalence of this is going to be 0 0.11667 or close to 17 percent. So um, you know you can leave it with 636 but likely you would see it in fraction either reduced format or non-reduced format for the test. Well question C we want to determine the probability of rolling the dice to result a pair of six. There's only one pair of six, right? One face of six in each of the dice. So that will be one over 36. Okay, so if you're looking at pair of anything on the dice, pair of ones, pair of twos, pair of three, that will be just one over 36. As each dice only have one face, that will be one or two or three or four and so on, right? Any question? So we practice a lot on these in cards. Okay, for 30, if a single card is drawn in a standard deck of 52 cards, what is the probability, probability of each of the event? A, if the card is a queen, 
there are four queens in a deck because there are four suits. There's queen of hearts, queen of diamond, queen of spade, and queen of clubs. Okay, four suits. So there will be four queen in a deck or four king in a deck or four jack in a, in a deck, right? So that will be four over 52. And for B, if the card is a red face card. So when you hear the term face card, that means it would, could be jack, queen, and king. So in red, we only have two suits that are red, the diamonds and the hearts. So we would have jack, queen, king that are diamonds and jack, queen, king that are hearts. So that means that we have six red face cards in the deck. So that will be six out of 52 is the probability. If the card has the same suit, so there are 13 cards per suit. If you go count ace as one, so if you go from one through 10, that gives you uh, what? And then add it with the 13, uh, with the three face card. So 10 plus three face card, that gives you 13. And that will be 13 out of 52. So there are 13 cards in the same suit. Okay, in the standard deck. If the card is an even number, okay. So when you're looking at the even number, we're looking at two, four, six, eight, and 10. So two, four, six, eight, and 10. That's five per suit. And then you would take that five multiplied by four because there are four suits per deck that gives you 20 out of 52. That would be an even number card. Any question on number 30? Okay. Sorry. For 31, uh, 10 balls, numbers one through 10 in the bag answer the following questions. A, the probability of drawing number 952 in any order of the three draws if the ball drawn is always return to the bag for the next selection. So we would, after we draw, we put it back. So we would look at the variations of the successful outcome. We can have 952, 925, 592, 529, 259, and 295. Okay, so that means that we would have six variations of drawing those three numbers out of a thousand possible outcome. Why is it a thousand? It's because it's 10 balls, right? And we're drawing, th we're drawing three from the 10 balls in the bag. So you would take the 10, raise it to the third power, which give you the sample space of a thousand. And you would have those variations of the thousand sample space. So your probability would be six divided by a thousand or reduced down to three over 500. Okay. And very much like our quizzes, we, you saw some of these questions showing up on the quiz, you would see them again on the final. For question B, number 31, what is the probability of drawing the number 952 in any order of the three draws if the balls are not returned to the bag before the next selection. So again, we would have the six successful outcome. You saw that from question A. And in this case, we are not putting the ball back. So you would have um, 720, right, possible outcomes because when you're looking at 10 and then you take one ball out, you would have nine 
and then you take one ball out and you would have eight. So you multiply those together, that gives you 720. So that would be the 720 possible outcomes. So we would take six divided by 720. That will be our probability for drawing 952 in any order and not returning the ball in the bag. We can reduce that down to one over 120 is your final answer. Okay, for question C, the probability of drawing the ball with the number eight in three draws if the balls are not returned to the bag for the next selection. So as we covered in B, we would have 10 times nine times eight, which gives us 720 possible outcomes. There are nine times eight times seven, which is 504 possible outcome that, that the do not include number eight in the three draws, okay? So in this, we would apply inclusion exclusion principle. So we would take 720, subtract 504, because 504 represents the balls that are not including number eight, which gives you 216 outcomes that includes the ball eight. So we would take 216 divided by 720, which gives you three over 10 as the probability of the um, outcome that would have number eight. Okay, we did this in our assignments. So you can go back to the chapter and the assignments and look over the questions if needed. Any questions with 31? So make sure we know how to solve these. Okay, 32, using the inclusion exclusion principle to determine how many positive integers between 100 and 987 are inclusive. So given to you is 987 and we wanted to take 987, subtract 100 and add the one so we can look at the size of that, right? So that gives us 888. We wanted to look at the, for question A, the positive integer between 100 and 987 that is divisible by eight. So every eighth digit is divisible by eight. So you would take 888 divided by eight, which gives you 111. That is, that is divisible by eight. And then for question B, how many positive integers between 100 to 987 that are even? So we would take 888 divided by two which gives you 444 integers that are even between 100 to 987. And then question C asks you how many positive integers between 100 to 987 that would have distinct digits. So we know that these have three digits the leftmost digit cannot be zero because it starts at 100. So there are nine choices. The second digit can be any digit but the first because they need to be distinct. So that means that there are also nine choices for the second digit. And there are eight choices for the third digit because again, it has to be different from the previous. 
So here we would then apply the product rule. We would take nine for the first digit times nine for the second digit times eight for the third digit, which gives us 648. Okay. Distinct digits between 100 to 987. Any questions with 32? Okay. All right. In the next one, we would use by no, uh, Pascal triangle theory and coming back to what we talked about in binomial theorem earlier. Right, and in this one, we can use Pascal triangle to solve for 2y squared plus 5z through to the third. And this is going to be raised to the fourth power. Okay. So when we look at this, the exponent is 4, so it's at this level right here. So we would write out our coefficient value, so 1, 4, 6, 4, and 1, okay? And then just like the other one, we would then start with 2, 2 to the first, okay? Y to the second, okay? And then raise that to the fourth power, then we would move to the second part of the equation, 5z to the third. We then choose 0, so 0 here, as we have 4 for the first part, okay? Plus, okay, 4 comes from Pascal triangle. Then you would have 2y squared. That's from here. And then in this one, we would raise it to the third because it's going to be one less for the next term. Times 5z to the third, raise it to the first. Okay. No matter what, they both need to be equal to the 4s exponent. Okay. Plus 6 times six from here, right? And then again, we would have the first term reduce it by one as we move to the right. Second term, increase it by one. Plus four come from the Pascal, okay? Again, the first, the first term, reduce it by one second term, increase it by one, and so on. So if you multiply everything out, okay, you would have 16 y to the eight plus 160 y to the six, z to the third plus 600 y to the fourth, z to the six plus 1,000 y, z to the third plus six, 625c to the 12, <clears throat> okay? So you might see something like this and it's gonna ask you to choose the output from this, okay? Now you can use Pascal or if you just, whichever method you use to be able to determine this, I'm fine with it. We're not showing our work on our tests so as long as you're able to achieve your final output, either using Pascal with binomial, like what we've learned, or other methods that you've used, okay? When I learned uh, algebra a long time ago, right, we were able to use like the FOIL method and so on. So you can use something like that, okay? But make sure that you double check your answer 
any question with the last one on part for the first part of the final review? Actually, not the last one, number 33, sorry. For 34, um, it asks you, what are the similarities and the differences between unordered linear search and ordered linear search? We went over search and sort. For the unordered linear search, it would need to go to the entire collection, right? If, if the search key is not found. So in, the, or, in order to determine if the object does not exist, it needs to search through the entire collection. And the collection is not pre-sorted. In the ordered linear search, the collection is pre-sorted. The search can be terminated as soon as it finds, right? As, as early, it, if it, it can be terminated early if and when it is determined that the number is sought or as yet not found is less than the, the element currently being examined. So it's slightly different in that you have to have it pre-sorted for the order, then you search and it can terminate it early if it's found. If it's not found, it will be less than the number of elements currently being examined. For 35, identify the steps to solve a problem using an algorithm. So first you need to design an algorithm or a step-by-step -step procedure to solve a problem. You need to analyze the correctness and efficiency of the procedure. Then you need to implement the procedure in programming language. Then you need to test the implementation. Okay. Any question with 34 and 35? Make sure we know the steps to solve a problem using an algorithm for the test and make sure that we know the difference between linear and uh, unordered linear search and ordered linear search. Okay, I'm gonna try to get through part two, okay? And if I don't finish, we'll pick it up next Monday, and I hope to finish. So if you haven't downloaded part two, please download part two, which is the second half of the class. Let me see. Uh, 30 questions. That gives me about a minute of questions. So let's try. Um, we already covered number one. It's repeating from, sorry about that. I forgot to change it. It's the same as number 31, okay? So you can put down C answer for part one, number 31, for question one. And then for the second part of question one, you can put down C answer from part one. Okay. 
but let me double check. Yeah, that is from the second one. That's fine. Yeah, just put C answer from 31, part one. Okay, I will start with number two. When searching through 2000 elements in a vector, assuming that the system takes 0.5 nanosecond to search through each element, how long will it take to search through the entire vector? So when, you, when you're searching using um, the linear search, right, you would have to then look through the entire container. So you would take 0.5 nanosecond times 2000, which gives you a thousand nanoseconds. You can leave it like that, or if you want to, you can convert it to minutes. So I will take a thousand nanoseconds for number two. Okay, we've done this already. Then for number three, um, if an application uses chunk search to find the match it, the matches in a hundred elements in an array, what is the chunk size? So you have a hundred elements and to determine the chunk size, you would take that and you would use the square root. So square root of a hundred is gonna give you the C or chunk. That's gonna be 10 elements per chunk. Okay. So make sure we know how to determine the chunk size for chunk search. Any question with two or three or both? Okay, number four, when searching an array that contains 8,400 elements, how many comparisons must be performed in binary search to find a result? Then you would have 13 comparisons because you would take natural log of 8,400 divided by natural log of two and I think I rounded up on this one. You can double check my math here. Um, so I would have about 13 comparisons, okay, for the binary search. And if for binary search, right, um, you would use, you can use natural log or log base two for the 8,400. Okay, you can plug that into the calculator. So here we would have 13 comparison for binary. And then for the chunk search, we would first determine the chunk size. So we would take 8,400 and take a square root of it. We would get 91, which is would be the size of our chunk. And then we would take 91, multiply it by two because for the comparison, it's going to be two times square root of n. n is your number of input. So you would have 182. Okay. So that will be 2c. All right, C for number four, how many comparisons needed to perform the linear search? That's easy. So the comparisons would be equal to N, which is the number of input. And in this case, you have 8,400 elements that gives you 8,400. For question five, it asks you to look at the provided data and explain how insertion sort is used in the given data. So we would look at the data, it starts with 87 and six. So at first need to compare six to 87. 
six is less than 87. It keeps it, it's going to move the six to the first place. And then 87 will be follow. Then it's going to next compare 14 with the six because 14 is the next number in the array and 87, right? Then place the 14 after the six because 14 is greater than six and 14 is less than 87. So I put that it compare 14 to six and 87, then place 14 after six as it is greater than six and less than 87 and so on. Okay, then it will move to the next number and, and, and such. So we just wanted to start with the first few steps. For question six, it gives you S is 13, 16, and 19. We need to determine the next term in S. Write a formula that represents the above sequence. So we would look at 13, 16, and 19, and this is what? Arithmetic progression, right? So the following number, we should take 19 plus three as D, which is the difference between the terms is three. So we would say that the next term in S is 22. And recall that we talked about arithmetic progression using our equation, okay? So here we would say that T of N is gonna be three times N. N is the position of your term, right? Like the first one is gonna be one, three times one plus 10, it's gonna give you 13. So T of N is three times N plus 10. And you can test it by plugging in n is equal to 1, and so on. OK. Then in the number 7, it gives you t of n is 5 times n minus 2 provide the initial part of the arithmetic sequence. So you would start with one and you plug in one. So T of one is equal to five times one minus two, which is three. T of two is gonna be equal to five times two minus two, which is eight. T of three is gonna be five times three minus two, which is 13 and so on. So once you have a few numbers, you would write out your sequence, 3, 8, 13, 18, and dot, dot, dot. I think I have an empty question for number eight there. So for the next question, it asks you to select the option that represents a quadratic sequence. Okay. And so option A is T of N is equal to three times N squared plus 6n plus 1. That will be the answer because it looks like a quadratic equation, right? Where you would have n is going to be raised to the second power, right? Plus b of n plus c. So a would be the appropriate option. And then looking at the rest of the choices, D would be the closest also, five times N squared minus seven N plus eight. So in quadratic sequence, the equation for that would represent quadratic equations. 
So you would then look at that quadratic equation format to select the appropriate options for quadratic sequence. So A and D would be the answer for that one. For the next question, this is the lengthy one as we looked at the difference in quadratic sequence for 8, 11, 13, and 14. We need to look at the two level of difference. So we would take 8, subtract 4, we would get a 4, right? 11 subtract 8, we would get a 3. 13 subtract 11, we would get a 2. 14 subtract 13, we would get a 1. So from that, we would see that there's progression in the difference, right? As it would reduce by 1 as it, it, it goes to the later term. So then we would apply the equation for quadratic sequence, which is a of n is equal to a times n plus b times n plus c. And then we will plug in the value, okay? So for the first one, that will be 4 is going to be equal to a times 1 squared because that's the first number, n is 1. Okay, and then B times one plus C. Write that out. Then we would have the second number eight. Plug in N is equal to two. Okay. And then multiply everything out. So you would have eight is equal to four times A plus two B plus C. And then the third number is 11, and then we will plug in n is equal to 3 into this equation. Then we multiply everything out. We would have 11 is equal to 9a plus 3b plus c. Then next, we would subtract the first one with the second one. I'm sorry, the second one with the first one, and we would have 3a plus b is equal to 4 as the result. Okay, we did this one in there. Okay, and then again, we would take the third one, subtract the second one. We would have 5a plus b is equal to 3 as the result. Okay. And then from the first level of difference, we would move into the second level of difference by taking the results and subtract them. So we would take 5a plus, 5a plus b equal to 3, subtract 3a plus b is equal to 4. We would get 2a is equal to negative 1. At this point, we're down to a single variable. We can then solve for a. So our a is going to be equal to negative half. Then our b is, then we're going to plug in a to solve for b into the equation that we previously have a and b in the second difference. So I would solve for b, and then our b is going to be equal to 11 half. Once we have a and b, we would then plug that into the first level difference equation, a plus b plus c is equal to 4. Okay. So after we plug that in, we would have c is going to be equal to negative 1. So once we have a, b, and c, we will plug it into our original equation for quadratic sequence, which is a of n is equal to a times n squared plus b times n plus c. So we plug a, b, and c in, and we would have negative half. 
n squared plus 11 over 2 times n minus 1 as your final answer. Okay. So as you notice for the exam, it's all the math stuff that we covered in this class, right? I don't think I'm gonna make it. I have 10 minutes left, so let's see. <laughs> all right. Um, in this, we are gonna look at arithmetic series and we are using Gauss trick, okay? So using Gauss trick, we are gonna determine the partial sum for negative, starting with negative 72, negative 60. So given the arithmetic sequence, we are gonna look at the partial sum, okay? And Gauss trick, you would take the number of terms divided by two times the first plus the last term, okay? So here we're trying to determine the the sum for the first six term, six divided by two, right? The first six term, number of term divided by two. So six divided by two times the first term, which is negative 72, plus the last term, which is negative 12. And of course you can add them together, but we wanted to apply the equation, the formula. So we would then have negative 252 as the output for the partial sum of this series, okay? So make sure we know how to use Gauss trick or know how to determine the arithmetic sum or arithmetic series. For number 12, you need to know how to use the geometric series equation to determine the sum of the sequence. And here we have 10, 30, 90, 270, and 810. And so given this equation, you would then plug in the first value, which is A, that will be 10, okay? Then one minus R, how do I determine the R? I will take the second term divided by the first term or the third term divided by the second term. So that will be your common ratio, which is three. And then my N, that will be four plus one as we are looking for four terms. So four plus one divided by one minus three, which is one minus R, right? And earlier we said that our common ratio is three. So multiply everything, calculate it, find the final result for this. I didn't put the final answer, so you can use your calculator to do that. We need to know the definition for recurrence, which is a mathematical formula that specifies the running time of the algorithm on the n elements. It is the relation for the recurrence is the equation that recursively defines the sequence where the next term is a function of the previous term. And so this is your answer. So I think I'm gonna not make it in five minutes. Okay, as we have quite a bit more to go. I'm sorry, I tried. Okay, so I'm gonna pause here. Make sure that I highlight it so I remember number 13. Okay, um, and then I'm gonna pick up the rest on the next session, which is next Monday. If you wanted to join, you can finish it by next Monday and turn it in.
Um, again, these questions you've seen from our labs and our assignments and our notes. So we would come back and finish the rest, okay, next Monday. On Wednesday, I will be available on Zoom in case you have questions um, regarding your project or anything that you need to be addressed. Um, and so I hope to see you next Monday. That will be our last time that we're going to meet for any kind of lecture. Um, so, okay. All right, type your name into the chat. Have a good night. I will see you next week, maybe. Okay. All right. Take care, everyone.